All right. Great. So thank, you much, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to see you all. Uh, I've seen a few of you at the last webinars that we did uh, and at the conference in, in Ottawa. So happy to be back uh, and bring you guys another uh, important topic uh, that you will hopefully find uh, relevant and, and useful uh, for your workplace and, and for your colleagues. Uh, being part of uh, Green Shield and Green Shield Health now as an organization, uh, the Health Depot Pharmacy, we're in a unique position where we can draw on colleagues in various parts of the industry. And we decided to kind of pull that card and phone a friend, uh, bringing you guys a, a fresh new topic, hopefully, that that uh, that will resonate with you around mental health and what it means in the workplace, particularly for those of you that are people leaders, how to, how to spot the signs, how to support those around you in the workplace. It might even apply at home. Uh, that may be dealing with, with, with these signs and, and barriers and, and what can we do to be good allies. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Debbie, who's uh, put together a, a presentation for you all uh, with, uh, filled with some tips and tricks. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, like he said, I am, or Ian said that I am a registered social worker. So if my technical skills aren't great, please forgive me because that is not my forte. So I am here today to talk about champions for change. So us as people leaders are those champions for change. And we're looking at mental health in the workplace and how we can make a difference. So for the next hour, I invite you to sit back and relax and try to just be engaged and um, present so that you can learn something new. It might be a little bit of a review for some of you, but hopefully there'll be some new ideas you can take away. Um, okay, do I not have control here? Oh, here we go, okay. Um, so our agenda really, we're gonna talk a little bit about mental health, what it is, the current landscape in here in Canada, why should we champion um, and help employees? How do we identify the problems that we see? and uh, a little bit of a framework for stepping in and helping those employees, how we support them, what are the resources that we can use, and of course, taking care of ourselves because we can't help others unless we take care of our own self. This doesn't like to move. Okay. We are currently in the midst of a mental health um, crisis. So according to a 2021 survey, Canadians report feeling emotionally drained from their work. So post COVID, 84% of Canadians are really saying that their mental health is worse. They're feeling drained, burnt out. And just so you know, burnout is really a combination of sort of the physical, mental and emotional exhaustion that people feel. It makes us feel really emotionally drained and unable to focus in our lives and function as, as well as we can. It's not a mental health disorder. It, it, there's no diagnosis for burnout, but it is a condition that people fall into sometimes when they become vulnerable, sometime preceding a mental health challenge. So how did we get here, really? I mean, if you think about it, there's been so much constant change in our world. The impact of all that constant change, coupled with uh, the pandemic fatigue and burnout, we're just drained. Um, many of us are feeling like we're in a state of languishing, so a sense of stagnation, of being stuck or really forced into an unpleasant situation. And think about the ongoing war, uh, wars in this world. There's so much going on that really people are, are really suffering. And that's where we are at at this point in time. So just to level set the stage here, what is mental health? So we all understand what we're talking about. And it's really a person's condition with regard to their psychological and emotional well-being. And according to Health Canada, mental health is the capacity to feel, think, and act in ways that engage one's ability to enjoy life and deal with challenges. And really in layman's terms, that means that um, if we have good mental health, that we feel well, we can cope with stress, we can achieve our personal goals, and often really meaning that we are resilient to be able to withstand whatever comes our way. So some of you might be familiar with this diagram. It's really just the mental health continuum, and it's a, a way to sort of show that um, 
mental health is not static. We're not stuck in one state of being that we have good mental health or we have poor mental health. It really fluctuates back and forth. It's fluid. It travels up and down this continuum all the time. We like to think and we like to stay in the green or yellow zone. Um, you know, life has natural ups and downs, you know, good days and bad days, the sometimes stressful things, uh, unexpected things. And so maybe we're reacting or we're feeling kind of out of sorts, but that's normal ups and downs of life. But when people start to really become more vulnerable or um, succumb to too much stress, too much burnout, they might fall into this sort of blue area or perhaps even the red area. Um, the upper portion of this table shows typical behaviors when you're sort of in those areas. So you might be able to identify yourself. And the lower portion really shows sort of actions that should take place if you're in those zones as to how to help yourself to sort of feel better. So this again is just a bit of an illustration to have you understand that mental health can fluctuate and move from time to time. So mental, um, mental health is sort of a macro issue. So what does that mean? Depression is a common illness worldwide. And now it's really considered the leading cause of disability leaves from work, especially in North America. Mood disorders cost the Canadian economy upwards of $50 billion a year in lost productivity. And it is estimated that any given in any given week, about 500,000 employed Canadians are unable to work due to a mental health disorder or challenge. So it is big. It affects, you know, bottom line, our economy and money. So why are we paying attention to this matter in the workplace? Really because mental health costs employers a high price. It results in absenteeism, which really equals the loss of work days and productivity. It can also lead to presenteeism. And if you haven't heard of that term before, it's really when employees are physically at work or at the workplace, but they're not functioning or performing fully. They're not present, maybe they're not focusing, and therefore the company really loses productivity from their inability to do good work. Short-term disability leaves also create a gap in work while those roles are left unfilled and again more loss of productivity so again loss of money a big barrier really exists that managers and maybe the workplace as a whole is very ill-equipped to manage mental health issues among their employees some stats tell us that about 26 of employees feel that managers only 26 effectively manage mental health issues. And that really means that 74% of managers are not helpful in managing mental health among their employees. 44 of managers have had no training on how to manage employees with mental health issues. And as a result, about 77% of Canadian employees report not feeling comfortable discussing a psychological health issue with their employees. So that's really not good <laughs> for us. And so what does this mean for employees in the workplace? A study performed at RBC found the following. Seven out of 10 believe that not disclosing a mental health illness at work would have a negative impact on their own personal well-being. But two thirds feel there are negative consequences on their personal relationships if they disclose. 67% feel it negatively impacts on their work productivity, and 65% feel it negatively impacts on coworker relationships. So there's a real dilemma for employees. And because of these beliefs, really, only about one third of those who need mental health support are actually getting it. And why is that happening? Why are people not getting the help they need? So I would say it really has to do a lot with stigma towards mental health. And stigma is a tough one. A number of years ago, Bell Canada came out with their big campaign, Bell Let's Talk. 
And that did a lot of good for us in terms of breaking down the stigma or getting us to talk about it. However, we have a far long way to go because really when it comes to stigma, it's very layered. There's self stigma. And that's really when a person feels bad about themselves because they're living with a mental health diagnosis because stigma exists. There's public or societal stigma that where there exists a bias against people with a mental health disorder. Often there's a lack of understanding or consideration and it might cause rejection, isolation and possibly discrimination. We also see associative stigma. And that's really when others around the person with a mental health diagnosis, such as their friends or family, may experience shame or discrimination as well. So again, it's not talked about. So if you have somebody at home suffering with a mental illness, chances are you're not necessarily going to be advertising that or talking about that openly at work with other people because it, again, gives people that associative stigma feel. And then there's also structural stigma. And that's when people with disorders are really excluded and devalued in the policies and practices of many institutions. And that's when laws, policies, and practices result in the unfair or even absent treatment of people with lived or living, lived experience or living with mental health. So it's complicated. And we really need to keep the conversation going and having people aware and talking about it so that we can continue in the fight to break down stigma. So why managers should take action? What, what's in it for you? Managers are often the first to recognize that an employee might be struggling. You would have a real advantage to seeing those changes in behavior. And hence, a good person to step in and help out. Caring managers are highly valued and can make a significant difference in each employee's experience. So your position as a people leader can be impactful to your employee. You may not realize it, but your view or your opinion might matter. If you're able to talk about it and be open about it, they may be too. By taking action, it might provide an early opportunity for an employee to actually seek support and get back on track. You can help normalize the situation and make a difference on them dealing with things sooner rather than later. We know that early intervention yields better outcomes. So think about it. It might really make a difference in someone's life. Direct impact on workplace productivity of an individual and their team, if you, if you intervene early again, it can help to clear up matters and not have an impact on the team's goals and productivity, which is part of your job and is good business sense, right? It's a good business move. And bottom line really is it just makes good sense to do it. And it is part of human kindness. But sometimes it's really hard, I think, for people to do it. And, you know, knowing when or what to say. So how do you know when an employee is troubled? You know, you don't want to do the wrong thing or suggest the wrong thing. And we don't want you to do that either. I'm going to suggest ways that you can sort of think about when it might be a time to have that conversation. So really, you're going to want to learn or recognize the signs when an employee is being challenged by their life and mental health. So what are those signs? Absenteeism, obviously, if they're away a lot, if those absent days become more and more. Um, presenteeism, I just mentioned that. So that's when employees are actually at work or they're showing up, but they're really not doing the job properly or much at all. Reduce quality or quantity of work. And this is if you notice a change. So it's not just that they're not great workers, but that they were perhaps top performers and suddenly their quality or quantity of work has diminished. If they're missing deadlines all of a sudden, if they're sort of showing some confusion, forgetfulness, perhaps they're withdrawing from social events, avoiding meetings, uh, there could be a change in their appearance. So they're much more unkept, 
not groomed like they used to be. They're experiencing irritability, showing anger. Anger in and of itself is not necessarily uh, a symptom that someone is, is suffering from some mental illness, but if suddenly it appears and it wasn't there before, sometimes there could be more employee conflict because of it. So, so those are some of the things just to look for. Some others might be inappropriate behaviors, again, that are unusual, negative attitudes, again, sort of out of the blue, excessive fear and worry about their own health or those of others, um, and also multiple physical ailments that don't have causes. So just suddenly complaining of a, a lot of um, aches and pains, which again, they didn't usually do. So these are noticeable changes that you would see in your employees or your coworkers, or even perhaps residents compared to their otherwise usual behavior. Understanding really where an employee's issues stem from can really help figure out how to help best or intervene best. So as we know, the symptoms that we're seeing are just the tip of the iceberg, and there's likely a lot of things going on underneath the surface that we are unaware of. So just to think about it, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to step in and have those difficult conversations about what's going on, but then trying to understand what's happening for them or what's going on in their life will help you to figure out how to best intervene. So sources of employee symptoms. So this is underneath the surface, right? So where is the problem stemming from? What's going on for the employee on a personal level? It could be stress, just stress in their personal lives, relationship issues, parenting, financial issues, addiction issues. For example, they might tell you that. It could be um, on the work front that they're having interpersonal issues, job-related uh, issues, problems or something environmental at work. So change in the workplace, um, policy changes or, or just mergers, acquisitions, things of those sort can be environmentally uh, troubling for employees. And this is an area which we'll talk about that you're going to want to be um, helpful in and you can be. Sometimes we see that work and personal issues intersect. So stress from work can spill over and cause a lot of problems or stress at home or stress at home consequently could filter into their workplace and or their functioning and their productivity at work. Another source um, of their stress or problems could be medical conditions that suddenly they're diagnosed with something um, or they're on a change of medication and that's been troubling and upsetting or disruptive for them as well. So you're going to want to think about, um, again, asking the important questions so you can figure out where and why and what is happening. So how do you help when an employee is troubled? So you're seeing the changes in these behaviors. Um, you know, you're recognizing that some of these things could be going on for them underneath the surface you don't know about. So the best thing to do, obviously, is to step in, to ask those questions, oops, and to start having the dialogue. Sorry about that. Technically, I'm not on top of my game. Um, so here is a framework really to help support employees. What are you gonna do? First, you're gonna start identifying what's going on for them. We talked about that. So pay attention to the observable signs. You know, um, notice what's happening around you. You're gonna wanna document it. So you're gonna wanna keep track, document the impact or how it's having an effect on the person. You don't wanna just say, uh, you know, I've been noticing you've been coming in late. You're you're late all the time. You want to know. You want to tell them the impact on that. You've been late. Your team's been missing you at some meetings. They can't count on you. Um, you've not been 
completing your work because you're coming in so late. For example, you want to going to keep you're going to want to keep track of the date, perhaps the issue, um, the employee's response when that happens, and what's going on, so that you have evidence or documentation. Um, if you notice this is happening, you might need to consult with others for support. You might need to go to your HR uh, support, uh, perhaps another manager or a colleague who might have been in a similar situation and having to step in and help an employee. Um, you might want to consider asking your EAP provider if your organization, your particular chapter has a, an employee assistance program, sometimes you can get help to get consults from them to find out how to intervene or best or how to support. You're going to want to set up in a meeting with that employee, you know, tell them you want to talk to them. It could be with your regular one-on-ones or set up a time to have a chat. And if you do meet with them in person from time to time, it's best to be in person. Otherwise, you can do it over the, a video call, and that sh is sufficient. Um, of course, you're going to want to really appreciate all the good performance that they've done, all the qualities they hold. Tell them some good things, you know, that you value about them. Then you're going to want to state sort of um, what you've observed. Tell them exactly what it has been. You're not jumping to conclusions that they're not doing well or that they're sick. You simply want to tell them what you've observed refer to your documentation, whatever you've been tracking if needed. Um, you're gonna wanna ask the employee to account for what's the discrepancy between how they were functioning three months ago and how they're functioning now. What's going on for them? Simply open up the conversation, invite them to sort of let you know and don't again jump to conclusions. So you're going to listen. You're going to want to understand what is going on. So understand the underlying issues, like all those things we just mentioned. Where are those symptoms originating from? And if you can understand if it's a workplace accommodation that needs to be made, then you can do that. If it's more of a personal level, then you're going to want to provide some direction or perhaps some resources for them to get some help. Again, if it's work-related, provide empathy, create a plan to address the workplace issues to the best of your ability and the workplace's ability. And if it happens to be personal, of course, you're going to want to refer, of course, provide empathy. Um, let them know that it is confidential, your conversation. If you do have to report back to HR, that's fine. You don't need to let them know what specifically is going on for the employee. You can let them know that you'll just leave it as some personal issues and not sort of break that confidentiality and trust. Um, of course, if it's both, then you're going to want to do a combination of what I've just mentioned. And finally, you're going to want to follow up. You're going to want to commit to a time and perhaps some goals that you both will obtain. Um, and of course, invite them to come back to talk to you at any time. Let them know your door is open and you're willing to listen. That's going to go quite a long way. So how can you be helpful? So as I mentioned, if it's a personal issue, you might want to suggest their employee assistance program or EFAP is employee and family assistance program if you have one or other resources that could be helpful to them that's outside um, community uh, therapy services. If you have um, benefits, they could go and see a therapist. Um, if you have an EAP, you would have access to what's called a manager's consult where you could speak to somebody. Typically it's a clinician um, at, at the service that could help you sort of tease through what to do and how to help. Keep in mind, this is, it's, it's time limited support. The problem might be really limited to just finding a solution or it may pass after some time if it's a personal issue. Um, and here the employee is really responsible for the follow-up. It is their responsibility to help themselves. It's like that old saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. You can provide the support and the guidance, but you they have to get the help and make the difference. When it's a work-related issue, on the other hand, 
you know, you're going to want to review the situation and possibly adjust um, the work situation or environment if that would be suitable to help their situation. Um, you're going to want to adjust conditions, perhaps expectations on the employee according, accordingly, because you're going to want to make some accommodation. You might want to check your policy or procedures to see what guidance is there. So what is your policy around accommodation in the workplace and how you can manage their situation better? You might want to consult with your HR for support to see what has been done, again, what you are able to do. And here the manager and the employee are really responsible for the outcome. So in this case, the manager does have some accountability to help. They have some skin in the game, really. The manager will need to help facilitate changes for that employee so they make the situation, the environment more conducive for them to continue and be productive. So I just, I threw in this slide just to talk about what is treatment sometimes for mental health. Um, often really with, when it comes to mental health challenges, it includes psychotherapy. Many people of note actually prefer to start with psychotherapy over medicine. Um, that's as a clinician, that's what I hear all the time. I'm just going to, you know, try to figure out if I can deal with how I'm feeling through psychotherapy before I consider taking medication. And that's absolutely fine. Clinical studies have really proven that therapy is quite effective, um, especially if people are just in that vulnerable stage. It can be really effective to gather strategies and skills in order to manage better and to move on more effectively. CBT happens to be one of the most studied models of therapy, and it's shown to have really good outcomes in managing moods better. Um, however, psychotherapy cannot manage every situation, and sometimes it does necessitate medication. So if someone is really struggling personally and their moods are low, um, they're not getting through it with psychotherapy, seeing a doctor might be their answer. I'm sharing this illustration as well because I find that it's quite a, an interesting um, illustration. This graph really shows the uptake of psychotherapy compared to using medication. Um, and, and it also includes users of both. So what is of interest really, you can see that a younger person is more likely to seek psychotherapy first or, or only. Um, and it actually decreases with age. So that would be the white bar. You can see that most people um, prefer that, again, at a younger age bracket. And as uh, people get older, they tend to either, um, they still use it, but they might let go of it or they might uh, otherwise defer to medication. And then you can see also um, the medication only is the one really on the left side, and it increases with age. So again, just really of interest as we're, we're here from the health depot talking about medication. So back to the course of action, when it's a health issue, you might wanna to refer to your occupational health policy, or again, speak with an HR person. They might be able to intervene and really help out or provide um, what, then the steps are to support that employee. Um, you might want to encourage the employee to consult with the physician. Um, it's their responsibility to follow up. Obviously, you're not going to get involved in their personal life, but you might want to give them some leeway so that they can actually attend appointments or, or give them some flexibility and let them know that you're going to support that. Employer and employee here are really responsible so again, you can make some accommodations and encourage them to, you know, seek help. And that's where you're responsible. The employee has to step up and take hold themselves. You might want to suggest EAP services if it's appropriate as well. Again, if you have it, if the employee has access to it, 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 it can really help as well. Um, if there is actually no acknowledgement of an issue, so there's no response when you're having this conversation, um, or just no reason is provided because they don't want to talk about it, then just stick to the workplace performance. Stick to the facts. Completely acknowledge what you've seen 
let them know you're going to continue to document the behavior. And really, um, if it is not acknowledge that there's something else going on, it might become a workplace performance issue. At that point, you're going to want to consult with HR for guidance. And here, if the employee is not giving you any indication of what's going on, then it really is their responsibility to make things better or make a change. So what are possible roadblocks if you are having this conversation and they are not acknowledging anything and they don't want to talk about it? So it could be that, you know, emotions are running really high. They're crying. Um, they might be upset. There might be, again, denial. They might just not want to talk and um, or not be open to what you have to say. So these are possible things that can happen and get in the way when you are confronting an individual employee. So anticipate that it might happen. It's normal. It is okay. You know, maybe they're not used to talking about themselves on a personal level, but keep in mind, the person is not going to fall apart just because you broached a sensitive topic. Um, be compassionate, be sensitive, uh, understand that you are just trying to invite them to open up and talk with you. They don't have to provide any kind of answers. Um, and really, if there's no discussion or they remain silent, just let them know that you can be approached at any time. And in the meanwhile, that you are going to probably continue to monitor their work performance because that is part of your job. And until things get better, you know, you are responsible for that oversight. So what are some effective suggestions for that employee to get help? I would say really, again, if you have an EAP available, that's always an easy thing to provide them um, access to. So ensure they know the telephone number or the link to get services. EAP services provide psychotherapy, so they have access to a therapist quickly. But there's also other, depending on their EAP, there's other services that can be helpful to them in their world. There's health advisory kinds of things. There's coaching, career coaching. Um, there's often legal advice, nutritional advice. Uh, sometimes there's a financial assistance, uh, not financial assistance, financial counselors to help. So if they're, again, situation is a personal issue about finances and they're really struggling behind the scenes, EAP can help take care of those issues that exist at home so that they come to work fully productive. Um, reinforce anonymity, of course, and the confidenti confidentiality of EAP services. They are completely confidential. If they are tied to the workplace, the workplace gets acknowledgement or stats about utilization of the services, but it's never tied to a person's name. And that workplace is never going to know who accesses. Um, so you can know that as well, that they are completely confidential. And of course, you're going to want to encourage them to um, know that your conversation is, is confidential as well. Um, perhaps encourage them to see their doctor follow up if they're not giving you anything. Maybe you can suggest it wouldn't hurt to have some kind of a screening done just to see that everything's fine. Um, and then get them perhaps to speak to a confidant, perhaps a spiritual advisor, whatever's comfortable for them, a family member, and encourage them to sort of seek some help. And I put this new uh, resource down. 988 is a new resource available in Canada um, for really people in distress. So it's a new sort of hotline across Canada, easy to access. Anyone can call, completely confidential, but it is for people in distress. It is um, also for people who are, you know, concerned about self-harm and such. So if they acknowledge any risk to themselves, absolutely, please give them this 988 number. Keep in mind, employees, again, are responsible for their personal lives and their work performance as well. Um, you're going to want to, uh, sorry, I think I've jumped a slide here. Well, we'll just go with it. <laughs> employees are responsible for their personal lives and their work performance. And the managers are really responsible for performance monitoring and management. Your first priority though, is taking care of yourself. So taking care of yourself so that you can take care of your team and others. 
And of course, that whole analogy about being on the plane, if the air pressure drops and your masks drop, they always advise you to put yours on first before you help assist others. And that's really the same um, concept here. Take care of you so you're able to take care of others. Uh, here's what I wanted to also suggest. So maintain manager employee boundaries whenever you're talking to someone. Um, when the issue is personal or about family, you know, just let them know that your conversation is completely confidential. Displaying empathy and a caring approach without getting personally involved is a way to manage yourself and the conversation. Um, and providing them knowledge and endorsement of resources available to them will increase the likelihood that they may consider using them. So how are managers doing in the end? Because really you're the ones taking care of your employees and we do need to know that we're doing okay. And quite frankly, studies have actually shown us that post pandemic managers are actually reporting doing worse than employees. Sadly enough, they feel they must be on consistently. They're not feeling like they're at 100% on top of their game or 100% in anything, that they're not really doing much of of everything. And they're not doing anything completely well at 100%. Um, they're worried about negatively being judged because they cannot perform as well as they used to. Um, they're worried that they're going to lose their jobs, perhaps a promotion or a raise, etc. Um, and it's been found that women leaders, three out of four, are actually considering leaving their leadership roles because of burnout and how they're feeling. So this is just a bit of a wake up call for everybody to know that you're not alone and it's tough for all of us. And more importantly, it's really important to take care and think about how am I going to survive this? How am I going to be um, there for my employees and feel okay so that I don't drop into that red zone? So self-care is always an important thing to learn and really think about making a, a bit of a toolkit for yourselves. So where do we start? I would say really acknowledge that you have stress and you need to take care of it because no one else is going to do it for you. Focus on what you are able to control, what is within your control and let go of the things that are not. I'm sure you've heard a lot of these before, but it's just a nice reminder. Take it slow and prioritize. Prioritize putting some of these self-care strategies or um, activities into your schedule. Practice self-compassion. So be kind to yourself. Give yourself a break. We all don't need to be on 100% of the time anyway. And we're human. We are not, we were not made to take on as much stress as is in our world these days. Take care of your basic needs as a starting point. I cannot stress this enough. People don't focus on the little things like eating properly, getting enough sleep, being hydrated, um, some basic exercise. Those are all the basics. Um, and really a foundational level to start off with. Uh, nurture healthy habits and take care of your mental health. And that's all these things are really um, helpful in taking care of your mental health. Develop that self-care toolkit. Think about what brings you joy. What is pleasurable in your world? Often, you know, we don't leave room for some of, again, the basics getting out and doing something physical, active, stretching our limbs after we're sitting at a desk all day long, connecting with people, social events. Often, you know, the cold weather keeps us home and we don't get out and actually mingle with people like we used to. And that brings us joy. That does help foster a good sense of, um, of well-being and, and mental health. Lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge what is within your control? What should you be focusing on? What can you do? Um, I mentioned this already, eat, sleep, and drink. I mean, drink lots of water. Fluids are good for us. I have my water bottle. I drink all the time. Exercise, taking a break, walking away from the desk for just a few minutes. Um, 
be kind to yourself. Again, self-compassion, talk with friends, reach out. Sometimes connecting really helps. Do whatever stress relievers uh, work for you. So could be exercise. It could be meditation. It could be some yoga. It could be um, taking a walk in nature. It could be listening to music, playing music, engage in life. And again, connection, family, friends, uh, co-workers, groups, associations, um, religious affiliations, being connected social really fills our soul and helps us to, again, stay grounded, stay connected, stay a little happier. And that today, folks, that's my portion of the presentation. I'm going to check the chat to see if there's any questions and I don't know if you wanted to ask um, I'm happy to field some questions will the slides be available yes we will have those available and yeah I think it is helpful to kind of look at what are the some of those underlying sources and you can kind of help yourself figure out how then to step in and help out oh the answer was there sorry <laughs> Um, okay, so framework, are there any actions or comment, comments, phrases that might be detrimental to employees, given the statistics of employees that feel it is not handled well? So, I mean, I would say, I don't, for the most part, you can't say anything wrong that's going to harm them. I mean, I understand there's, you know, that risk of ending the conversation or shutting them down. But what I would suggest more is think about, you know, inviting them to share with you or having a conversation that's not judgmental. Don't use words that are accusatory or judgmental. You know, let them know, be human. I always say to managers, just be yourself. Think about how would you like to be addressed or how would you like it to be handled if it was you? Um, sometimes you're going to actually get a lot more out of your employee if you can just treat them like they're a person first before an employee. Um, level with them. You can say, I've noticed some things. I'm concerned. We want to help. You know, we are here to support you. Um, part of what is helpful for employees to know is if they are working in a psychologically safe work environment where they're allowed to speak up, where they're allowed to make mistakes, where they can be uh, supported and, you know, treated, I guess, fairly, then they're more likely to open up. But having that conversation, again, reserve some time, but that's away from people that you're not going to be interrupted. You can be honest with them and say, this is a little bit of a difficult conversation for me to have. However, I really do, you know, care, or I'm concerned about you. And I have noticed and mention what you've noticed. So don't jump to conclusions saying, it seems to me that you are not doing well, or perhaps something's going on at home, but more open-ended. I'm concerned for you. Um, Here's what I've noticed. Can you share? Can you can you elaborate? Can you um, let me know what's going on? Is there anything going on that I can help with? And so on. So it's really about opening up that conversation, knowing that it's safe, knowing that it is confidential. And, um, you know, if it comes to it, you, you want to kind of let them know they're not going to lose their job over this. You just simply want to know how to better assist because you don't feel like you're getting the best out of them. And what can you do to help? So things like that. Like I said, if you say something sort of wrong, likely they're not going to go running. They're probably going to welcome that opportunity and have a bit of a letdown, like, oh, someone really understands or is listening. That's normally what happens versus um, a shutdown. Any other questions or comments? I know that was a fast hour. 
I did a lot of the talking. Um, you will absolutely have the slides that you can refer to. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Yeah, thank you so much, Debbie. Um, yeah, as Debbie said, if anybody has any other questions, feel free. You know, we do have a few minutes left. So if you want to put them in the chat or if you feel comfortable unmuting or putting your video on and just asking, I'm sure Debbie's okay to answer those questions. Um, yeah, we'll give it another few seconds. And if anything pops up, we'll go there. Otherwise, um, yeah, I will close, I'll close this off after a very informative presentation. Oops, I guess I better stop sharing that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, well, um... yep. Yeah. Thank you everyone for allowing me to be here and share this with you and have a good afternoon. Yes, thank you so much, Debbie Garchon, FSW and RSW um, for Green Shield for presenting this webinar. And obviously to our partners, the Health Depot Pharmacy as well for hosting. And yeah, as stated in our intro, we will send a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar um, and also the presentation slides um, in the coming days. So stay tuned for that. And if you do have any remaining questions, you don't have to have them on the spot. Feel free to get in touch with um, the Health Depot Pharmacy by Green Shield. Um, we'll share the contact info for Alicia Stanislaus, who is your contact there. And we will also um, share contact info for, for Debbie and, and Nima as well, if interested. So um, thanks again for attending. And we look forward to seeing you in another webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>